in order to get things done, you almost, you, you're forced to collaborate, otherwise it doesn't work. And I think we've, we were a small company for, a, we're still a small company, but you know, we were a less than 20 person company uh, for probably the first three or four years of our existence. And over the last, you know, two to three years, we've grown, um, you know, nearly you know, two or three times that. So we're, um, you know, we've kind of morphed into that, but that culture, because it was there in the beginning and it, it went on for a few years, it just absolutely transitioned into as we, you know, become a little bit bigger. Um, the flexing doesn't happen, you know, on a daily basis like it probably used to, uh, but it certainly is a core part of our culture. And I, I'm, it's probably the thing I'm most proud about our company. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? When you think about collaborating with your team, what is that vision you have? with your people using the tools as they're meant to be, where every project has input from other team members, that everyone's playing at their highest game. They're contributing to the work in new ways. Collaboration is powerful, and it takes a team spirit to make that happen. What we're gonna talk about today is how do you increase your capacity for collaboration? How do you as a leader lead your team to put collaboration front and center with this whole, uh, COVID-19 thing going on right now really is something that a lot of teams are thinking about. How do we collaborate in a virtual world? We can no longer drop by someone's desk or see them in a conference room or just talk to them as we're having coffee about certain projects. So you have to be much more intentional about collaboration. Today, we have a special guest. He is the founder of Epion Health. He is Joe Blewett. Joe grew this company really fast. He's got over uh, 47 employees. They, they were number 276 on the Inc. list out of 5,000. They grew at almost 16,000% over three years. I share all this with you because the one thing Joe said that contributed to that success is collaboration. So today we talk about some of the steps he sees that you could take, some of the rituals they have that you can actually model that and reinforce that and operationalize the idea of collaboration across the company. Thanks for tuning in here to Grow Think Tank. Really excited about sharing this with you. And before you run, I have done so many interviews of the last few weeks. I have such a, an exciting time to share with you that those interviews have been organized into the 12 core principles of fast growth companies. So all you have to do to get that is go to genehammett.com slash worksheet. And so you can get the 12 principles and I've been able to uh, go in there and find which episodes will align to each individual episode. When you subscribe to Growth Think Tank, you will find exactly what you need so that you can move forward. And many of them haven't been published yet, depending on when you're hearing this, but you can you can tune in to the date that means the most to you. So here's the interview with Joe. Joe, how are you? I'm great, Gene. How are you today? Fantastic. We are coming to you from Growth Think Tank to have a conversation with Joe uh, Blewett. He is the founder of uh, Epion Health. Tell us a little bit about what Epion Health does. Uh, sure, Gene. Uh, we're in the uh, healthcare IT world, um, providing software for uh, provider organizations, you know, healthcare provider organizations, uh, to basically prepare patients for their medical appointments. Um, we digitize all of the paperwork that's typically involved in a in a appointment that you know someone might a patient would have with their with their healthcare provider you know all the consent forms the collection of data um, around demographic data and and medical data that would be appropriate to uh, gather ahead of an appointment as well as present information to patients appropriate um, it's very much a rules-based engine uh, smart algorithms that kind of put in front of the patient exactly what should be what should be put in front of them to support that specific appointment um, so basically, we're taking all the paperwork uh, away from um, you know the, the the whole process there, and really driving efficiencies uh, in the healthcare environment, as well as actually gathering uh, a significant amount of more um, healthcare or health-related data, medical data that sometimes just doesn't get, get get captured because people get really busy. 
So um, it's kind of a, a play that is an efficiency play, but it's also, you know, really driving, you know, better outcomes in healthcare because we have a really smart interview that gets the patient prepared, but also when the provider and the patient sit down in the, wait, in the exam room, uh, they've had a really, uh, the provider is now supplied with the, you know, kind of a really strong background around, about that patient. So, Joe, we've been, uh, we, we're just kind of joking, our hair is getting a little bit longer. You said it's yeah. been four weeks since you've had a haircut. Uh, you've been on uh, working virtually for, for how many weeks now? So our company's in our fifth week of the COVID, you know, uh, work from home um, kind of mandate. I, I don't know the background of this because this is the first time we've actually talked. You talked with my, uh, my team, Sarah, on um, setting up this interview. But were you half virtual before, completely uh, virtual? Give us kind of the, the mixture there. Yeah, um, we, we were definitely a mixed uh, virtual and in-office company. We have an office in Hoboken, New Jersey, and another one in uh, just north of Boston. But we have a distributed team uh, actually around the country and, and, and in uh, a few countries outside of the U.S. Um, so very much a virtual uh, atmosphere already. Um, the, the transition to full, uh, full remote work is, is actually very simple for us. Uh, almost everyone actually in the company works remotely at some point. And we actually have a, a remote... You know, just coincidentally, we have a remote Friday that we do all year round. So we don't go into our offices on Fridays, typically, unless there's a special occasion to do so. So um, we do that for different reasons. And part of it is around the culture and, you know, uh, kind of uh, giving people a little bit of a break from the commute in the Boston and New York, New Jersey area. Um, but because of that, we had all the tools in place. It was, it was, you know, nothing that that was not part of our you know, a major transition, except the fact that it's going on now every day for, you know, over a month. But other than that, um, you know, we were, we were ready to do this full remote thing. Well, I wanted us all to get some context around how you've been uh, working together. And I know that your company grew really fast. You were number 276 on the ink list, uh, yeah. which was about, you know, almost 16,000% over a three-year period. One of the things that you had said was the key to getting there was collaboration. Why has collaboration been so important for your company to grow fast? Yeah, I think um, it's, I think when you have a small company, especially, um, I think collaboration is incredibly important uh, because you just, you just don't have someone that you can, you know, if for everything that needs to get done that you can say, okay, you own this, this, or this department owns this, or this small team owns this, because you don't have enough of those to go around. Um, so what happens is you know, work flexes, right? And important, the importance of projects flex, and um, certainly company initiatives come up that you might not have. Like for example, when we bring on a a large health group, a you know, large organization with you know several hundred providers at a time, or even bigger, um, we might not have an implementation or a, an account management team that's big enough to handle that. Um, that initial implementation. So we borrow um, from other parts of the company, including our, our development team early on, um, just to be able to support something like that. So, uh, and it, that goes across, you know, um, sometimes, you know, the sales team uh, needs help um, because there's a, a big event coming up or a marketing campaign or otherwise. So I think the work flexes. And um, because of that, if you, if, in order to get things done, you almost, you, you're forced to collaborate, otherwise it doesn't work. And I think we, we were a small company for, we're still a small company, but you know, we were a less than 20 person company uh, for probably the first three or four years of our existence. And over the last you know, two to three years, we've grown um, you know, nearly uh, two or three times that. So we're, um, you know, we've kind of morphed into that, but that culture, because it was there in the beginning and it went on for a few years, it is absolutely, transitioned into as we you know become a little bit bigger um the flexing doesn't happen you know on a daily basis like it probably used to uh, but it certainly is a core part of our culture and i I'm, it's probably the thing i'm most proud about our company whenever anyone needs help with something they can literally just ask and and because they've been helped uh in the past they typically will will you know uh it's just a normal part of what we do um so you know i think when you help someone else and then you ask them for help, then you're going to, you're going to get it just because that's just what they're used to. That's, it's not like, Oh, why, why are they asking me for help? 
Um, I, I don't do that. I'm a, you know, my job description doesn't have that. Um, so I think it's just, it's a, um, in the beginning, it's kind of like, you know, when you buy an old used car, you have to figure out how to keep it running. Right. So in, in our case, you're, you know, you're starting out with a small company with a small team. You got a lot of things to do. You kind of got to do, you got to. I, I know so, that, uh, you know. a lot of companies think about the tools that enable collaboration. I'm sure you've got some tools that you use. Um, yeah. Off the top of your mind, what are the top tools that you you guys use? Yeah, um, you know, I'm going to answer. I'm going to give you one last uh, point on the last. Okay, go ahead. Function, just real quick, because I think it's super important. The other thing that we do in our company is we celebrate collaboration, and we reward collaboration, and we we make it. You know, we we bring people, uh, and we congratulate people, and and uh, make them uh, feel good about their collaboration. And I, I think that's a really important part of it. In terms of the tools that we use, um, you know, it's, it's, I'll just tell you, um, we could not have done this as easily, you know, even five years ago because the tools just weren't there. And especially from a remotely and distributed team, um, you know, the, the, all the, like Slack, as an example, I'd say Slack is a core tool of our company, um, as well as all the Google products um, in terms of uh, file sharing and things like that. Uh, we use, you know, several or a couple of different, you know, video platforms in addition to Slack, depending on the size of the audience and the a team, for example, you know, when we, you know, when we get the whole team together, we'll use a different video sharing product. So I think, you know, GitHub from a developer standpoint and things like that, uh, the tools, you know, are, have matured, um, you know, fortunately for us, because I think at a time where, you know, we were trying to grow a technology company, the technology, you know, was in place, the infrastructure to, uh, to certainly be open to uh, to support those kinds of collaborative methods, um, and then inside the office there are different tools that we use in terms of how we share information, and it's also around meetings and and meeting cadence and and things like that. It's not all technology. I think a lot of it actually has to do with organizational structure um, and just a basically a, a sharing between departments that happens on a, a very regular basis. Uh, whether it's through technology or, or face to face. Now, hold on for a second. Joe just talked about the need to celebrate and reward values. In this case, he was talking about collaboration. But no matter what your values are, you want to create a place where you can celebrate and reward those individuals that are demonstrating it every day. I see this happening when in companies that really do believe values are important to their growth. They want everyone to demonstrate them every day, not just sometimes. They create a rhythm to celebrate and reward those people that are operating by those values. It really is important if you want people to repeat those behaviors. Back to Joe. Well, I know a lot of people want to figure out the tools that make it work, but I always say it's not just the tools. It's, it's about the values of the company. And I know yeah. values are pretty important to you. When you thought about making collaboration a central point within how you operated, how you, you guys communicate, and how you actually create a team. Uh, go a little bit further into the values of collaboration. I think you know, it has to start at, you know, at the leadership level, right? So um, I certainly, you know, I come from a military background. I was in the Air Force for um, you know, 20 plus years, and I was, uh, I was a pilot as well. Um, so you, know, the, you have to collaborate as a team. I was on a, a crew. I ran a a crew flying either uh, transport planes around the world or uh, for about 17 years I flew a, a plane called the KC-10 extender which is an air refueling platform there's four or five people on the crew at all times as a minimum and um, you just have to collaborate a tool to get uh, as a team to get the job done so it's something that's literally core to me for many many years um, and I think you know sports background as well so you know you, you'll see I think as a common thread uh, actually in business is to find that, you know, it's a pretty common thing to hire leaders that come from both, you know, military and or a sports background. So I think um, that background for me, anyhow, um, is just kind of how it's part of my DNA uh, or it became part of my DNA, uh, if that's possible, um, over the years. So I think, and then we hire people around, uh, you kind of, as you set values, people become, I think, um, attracted to that and that type of culture. So I certainly have tried my best to uh, uh, to lead in that in that sense, and and again from my background, and then you put people around you that that typically are going to be at least have those kind of similar values, 
you don't always want to uh, surround yourself with exactly you know, clones of yourself or anything, but I think there is a, there's an attractiveness to a culture that people feel like uh, that they want to be a part of. So it needs to be, you know, certainly at the lead, but uh, as you hire people, they, they kind of, I think, get uh, in, in uh, a lot of times uh, become enamored by that and will either, um, either I think, embrace it or some, some people might leave. Uh, we certainly have had people that have come to our company that did not, were not collaborative. And honestly, they are not here anymore. And um, that, that's a pretty rare thing because I think we try to communicate that up front. But I will tell you that the, the few, and it's very few people that, that either I've had, a, that I've had to let go or just they left for, for reasons that it just wasn't working out, maybe their decision or our decision, uh, nearly to the, to the person that is because they were not really a collaborative person. And um, again, when you have a really big company and you need somebody to just run a tab, you know, a spreadsheet, you own that thing, that's what you do every day. You can probably get away with having, a, you know, some of those folks on the team and you need them. Uh, in our case, we don't have any single one job that somebody can just shut the door and get it done that is going to be a full-time job. So um, I think we just need to have collaborative people on the team. Hold on. Joe just said every day in relation to celebrating the values. It's not something they do occasionally, every day. This is a concept of operationalizing the values. I mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to mention it again. Operational values is a missing step with most companies. They think having the values is enough. Operationalizing the values is something where they're repeated every day. I have a very special way to describe this to clients. One of them is what you can do in the beginning of meetings. And when everyone's sitting around and gathering, just before the, the core meeting starts, you take three or four minutes to honor the core values. That moment is for people to share stories about a specific core value or any core value they want, letting people know that these things are happening on a daily basis. Challenge them to come up with something that happened today or yesterday or this week, whatever they want to share, but you want to make sure that you are encouraging the values every day. Back to Joe. I know you mentioned about uh, rec recognizing people and rewarding people for demonstrating uh, collaboration. Do you do that in certain times, like inside certain meetings or every quarter, every once a year? What is the, the cadence of that? Yeah, I'll just give you an example. Uh, um, it's actually literally every, every day in some cases and every, every day or every month. Yeah. There's some incentive programs that we have built around collaboration. And for example, we have teams that are in, you know, monetarily incentivized to work together. Uh, for example, our customer success team account management implementations uh, specifically are incentivized around revenue growth. Um, and th therefore they're kind of forced to work really, not forced, but they're incentivized to work closely with the sales team to make sure that the revenue that they bring in and we're a SaaS based company. So it's a uh, software as a service as they sign deals, the, the, the team is incentivized actually to collaborate with the sales team, make sure the paperwork is all correct. The sales team is obviously, um, kind of incentivized to work closely with the implementation and account management team because their commissions are, are associated with success. They're, we don't pay everybody you know, just up front for signing a contract. That contract has to result in, in, in a successful onboarding and, uh, and a SaaS-based uh, um, service model. So uh, there's some things you just build in like that. Uh, we also have you know, bonuses, company bonuses that are associated with how the whole company does across departments. Um, and I think there are certainly, we have reward, awards that are actually given out, uh, you know, the, the top team player, for example, every year we, we have somebody designated that, that award. Um, and throughout the year, we, we have spontaneous uh, awards. Um, we had a, uh, an award uh, about a year ago for one of our support folks who literally got a, a, a trip um, of you know, full uh, paid trip to a tropical, a tropical place. Uh, I won't name that um, just for being a great team person. So, and that was spontaneous, literally. So and we do so that kind of thing all the time. I want to ask you to, to maybe project a little bit. If you were sitting down with a, a leader of a company that wanted to have a higher degree of collaboration. Yeah. What are the core elements? I mean, we may have to go back over some of the things you've already mentioned, but you know, if you broke it down into three, four parts, what would you say those parts are? 
again, uh, there's a, uh, again, you're going to re we're going to rewind here a little bit. So I just want to, it's okay to rewind right now, but I'd say the number one is you have to set the tone for this is how we work. This is how we operate. And um, that has to come from the top. Um, I'll also say that, you know, I, we've hired, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older, uh, certainly in my fifties. Um, you know, as I hire into the younger generation, which is, which is a, a lot of the, uh, uh, certainly a lot of the initial hires, a lot of software developers and young, you know, younger folks, just, just kind of the way our hiring happened early on. Uh, they came in with a lot of like, they're, they're, they're connected and talking to each other all the time on, you know, using technology. And I actually learned a lot from that. It was a, that, that generation and the tools that they brought to the table. I was like, I kind of like my PC and I like my, the, what I do with my, and I was like, no, we're going to the cloud. So I think a lot of it came from people that we hired that they brought it with them, which was really, really cool. Um, but I think again, back to your question, what would I tell somebody? I'd say, you know, set the standard, the expectations. If someone comes on a team that is not collaborative uh, type and you find that out later, if it's a core part, it's just like any core value of your company. Uh, if someone is on your team that does not uphold the core values, and for us, this is definitely one of them. It's literally our number one core value, actually. Um, I would say that you need to need to get rid, not get rid of, sorry, not to be harsh. They should not be on your team. If, if there's any single employee that does not embrace all of your core values, then they should not be on the team, no matter how good they are otherwise. Because your core values will fall apart if, um, if in fact you allow uh, your team to have uh, you know folks that don't abide by them, so um, I'd be super uh, super careful in the hiring process that you actually match people up. If they if they don't uh, actually um, seem to fit in with your core values, I wouldn't hire them to begin with. If you find out later, I would uh, make decisions early on um, on uh, you know transitioning those folks out. And then uh, finally, I think you have to make sure that the systems are in place and that, that folks, you know, now had to use the systems and actually, you know, take advantage of uh, the collaborative tools that you have in place or available to them. Well, I appreciate you going through that. I want to put just a spotlight on one last thing before we wrap this up, Joe, is, is really hiring the right people. Is there any specific question or something you're looking for? when you're looking for someone that's already got, you know, a tendency naturally toward collaboration? Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm, I'm pondering that a little bit just because I think there's a, I think there are a few ways you can find this out. Uh, the way I find it out, uh, I hope in my part of my interview, and I, I try to share some techniques with the rest of the team, but, you know, I actually talk to people about, um, you know, what their kind of core upbringing. Uh, I, 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 by the time somebody's done with it, and it's probably going to tip people off that might interview with me in the future, but I, I don't mind. <laughs> I, I want to know what you were like as a, a you know, a teenager, uh, what your high school experience was like, what your college experience was like. Um, I, I do ask, you know, about, you know, were you on a, in a band or did you play, you know, team sports or, you know, just kind of like kind of understand where they came from. And, and not necessarily that that's going to always predict what, what they're doing today or even you know, uh, in the near future, but it certainly gives me a nice baseline. Of, is that the type of, uh, have they put themselves in those environments early in their lives and have they continued that on? And uh, we do a really deep dive um, into uh, every, every single job someone's had, not just the last job or two. And I think that gives us a big picture of a really clear picture of, you know, kind of the person that we're, we're looking to bring on our team. And um, I think a lot of folks just talk about their last job or two. And, and if it, it doesn't have to be in our industry, I, I still want to know, you know, where they came from. And I think that, that, that typically will tell the line doesn't change very, very much. You know, if you have a trajectory, it's very, it's not often that it's going to completely change. So you can kind of back, you can kind of like back into, is this person on a general trajectory of, of what we want in our company or, or is it just a short term, you know, thing or, you know, otherwise. So, and um, I, I'll tell you that sometimes, you know, older people, you know, that I might interview are really surprised that I care about what high school sports team they're on. <laughs> um, but I learn a lot in those conversations. Um, so that, that's probably where I get it. I, I get to that. And I'm trying to understand who the person is, not necessarily, you know, how much growth 
that they delivered in their last sales job. That's important as well. But if they don't have the core DNA, the core background, um, then what they did in their last job is, is it might be just a fluke, right? Um, I think the core DNA is what you're really looking for. Well, you'll find, Joe, if you listen to, to many of the interviews here, one of the most important things is to really be clear about what the values of the company are and to hire people by that. And there's many different kind of episodes I've gone into the details of that, but I was kind of curious where you were, and I really appreciate you sharing how you go into the background. I will say that if someone took the time to listen to this, if they're not a collaborator, they're probably not going to continue forward with you, which is fine. But if they are, it's okay because they've taken some time to get to know you and the company and, and done some research. So it, I'd love to hear back from you if they actually do listen to the, to, to the interview. Yeah, uh, that would be, that'd be uh, pretty fun to, to find out down the road. So Joe, thanks for thanks being for here on the show. You. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And um, uh, I, I really like what you're doing here. Thank you. What a great interview. I love this concept of collaboration. It doesn't just stop with tools. It actually has to be baked into how you work, how you hire, onboard, develop, and how you exit people through the company. When you think about collaboration, if you want to embrace that to a higher level, it starts with you. Joe said it. You have to embrace it first. You have to make it a central part of how the team is going to operate. And you have to reinforce it or operationalize it across the company. When you think about collaboration, you think about your own uh, need to change, then think about me. The defining moments of your leadership is exactly what I help you do. If you are struggling in some way that you want to get something in the business that you don't have, then make sure you reach out to me. I'd love to get to know you. I spent the last 10 years dedicated to serving individuals like yourself, founder CEOs, to be better leaders, to go beyond the success they have, to really create something that they're proud of, to be the leader that their team is craving. If you have any questions, make sure you reach out to me, gene at genehammett.com. As always, lead with courage. We'll see you next time.